Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, I'm going to be working on three non-functional retro iPods from 2003. These iPods are almost as old as I am. We have a 10, 15 and 40 gigabyte model to work on. I received these in a larger lot of devices quite some time ago. I've grown to love these older iPods, but haven't yet worked on anything older than a fifth generation. So this should be a fun project. The first of the three is this 15 gig model that doesn't turn on. It's got the regular scuffs and scratches you'd expect from one of these iPods. However, it's also got some markings on the side indicating someone's had a little bit of trouble in the past getting inside the device. I will open it up to install a new battery and see if that brings the device back to life. These iPods are actually quite easy to open, especially if someone's been in them before. And using a metal tool, I can simply release the clips and pull the back housing away. It is connected with a cable at the top which will leave connected so we don't damage it in the removal process. Next to come out is the hard drive cable which is attached to a piece of rubber. With that out of the road you can see the battery has expanded and is very sticky. You can also see it's been replaced at some point so we're going to need to do another replacement and hopefully we'll get some life out of this iPod. Replacement batteries for the old iPods are getting increasingly more difficult to find. I did however find some that are apparently brand new and you can see just how thin it is compared to the one coming out of here. So I simply need to press into place our new battery, reinstall the hard drive connector and get our old hard drive reinstalled before reconnecting our battery into place. Flipping the iPod around, it boots right up However, there is another issue. It appears this iPod has a dead hard drive and is stuck at the Apple logo indefinitely. I was able to boot the device into disk mode, however, it didn't show up on any of the computers I tried. So we'll need to replace the dead hard drive with some flash storage, specifically a 64 gig SD card, which is the maximum stable capacity this iPod can handle. But of course, you can't just plug any old SD card in where the hard drive was, so we'll need to adapt it to an IDE interface. Using an IDE to compact flash adapter, I can achieve this. However, the adapter isn't made for an iPod, so I'll need to do two little hacks to make it work. I will need to modify the jumper pins as the connector sits too high. So I'll desolder the connector and jump the two wires of the solder pads together. This will ensure the drive is set to master. If you've ever worked on old computers, you'll know that master is for your hard drive and slave is for your CD or floppy drive. Connecting the SD card into the compact flash adapter, I can put the two halves together, tape it to ensure it doesn't fall out, and I can connect it into the iPod. Our next hurdle is the alignment pin on the iPod cable is stopping the adapter from correctly fitting. There's a piece of plastic on the side which has no use to us, so I can carefully trim it with some side cutters and then apply some adhesive to the back and reinstall our adapter into place. This time it fits perfectly and is now stuck into position. I can reconnect the battery and test out the iPod. Of course it powers on but still has no operating system, so it's time to take care of that. I connected the iPod with a Firewire cable to a PowerBook G4 and launched iTunes. For some strange reason it didn't show up, so I used a USB cable instead this time the iPod showed up and I could restore its factory software. As it turns out, this version of iTunes no longer connects to Apple servers. So I grabbed a MacBook Pro and hooked the iPod up via USB. This time it showed up and I could restore the iPod. Everything appeared to be going well until I got this message saying that I must use Firewire to restore the iPod. The Pro didn't have a Firewire 400 port so I pulled out this MacBook. And if I can get iTunes to open, we might actually have a shot at restoring it. With a Firewire cable connected, you guessed it, it still didn't show up. After messaging a mate, it appears this is a common issue and that the iPod can't actually be restored with Firewire in the first place, at least anymore. The way around this is to connect it via USB and uncheck all the options in iTunes, sync the iPod, and then restore. And would you believe it? I still got an error. Even hotspotting from my Blackberry, the iPod wouldn't restore and ended up just corrupting itself and entering some recovery mode, which prompts to restore via Firewire. The reason behind the whole Firewire issue is the iPod will only charge with Firewire and not a USB connection. In the end, I wiped the iPod in disk utility in macOS Extended 
trying again to uncheck all the options in iTunes, the MacBook froze. So after a restart, I tried again. This time around it went through, eventually prompting me to connect a Firewire charger to complete the install. After connecting the charger, the iPod booted right up into an operating system and can finally be used. I can snap the casing back together and that's one iPod done and dusted. Moving on to our second, this is the 10 gigabyte model, which is also not powering on. It appears to have more scratches than the last iPod with some adhesive residue on the back. Connecting a Firewire charger, you can see nothing appears on the display panel and pressing any of the buttons, the iPod does not come to life. This iPod also has signs of entry with the back panel being slightly bent. Inserting a metal tool, I can separate the two halves of the iPod. This time around, I'll try and disconnect this back panel, although I wouldn't advise doing this as the connector itself is very fragile as I found out. It did break away and it took the solder pads with it. This flex cable may have become brittle over time, but if this does happen, the cable itself is replaceable, so I could fix this problem. I will connect up a fresh battery so we can test out the iPod and connecting a Firewire charger. The iPod is still dead, however has quite a lot of coil wind. So there's power definitely getting to the board, but there is something more going on with this iPod. I will remove the hard drive so we can take a little bit of a closer look at the motherboard to see if there's any obvious signs of damage. I noticed the hard drive in this is a 15 gigabyte hard drive, not a 10 gig, which it should be given the writing on the back. Comparing the two hard drives from the iPods I've currently worked on, one of them's 10 and the other is 15 gigs, which leads me to believe that these iPods were owned by the same person and the hard drive had actually been swapped between the two. Getting a closer look at the frame on that dead iPod, you can see how beaten up it has gotten when the last person has tried to open it. Removing the battery, we can get a little bit of a closer look inside. There's no obvious signs of water damage or physical impact or anything like that, but I will remove the motherboard so you can get a closer look at the internals of this 2003 iPod. You can see the display is detachable, so that should be a salvageable part from this iPod. As for the click wheel and such, I'm not sure, but I'm gathering it's also working. Our last iPod is this, 40 gigabyte monstrosity, which while working has a very weak battery, but it is in the best condition of the three and appears to have never been opened. I will take extreme care in opening this to ensure I cause no scratches on the housing whilst trying to open it. These older iPods are a lot easier to open than a seventh generation. Some might argue that using metal tools will increase the chances of scratching or scuffing the iPod. While that's true, it is also extremely difficult to try and open the iPod any other way as many of the plastic tools just are too thick to get in between the gap. Once one side of the clips are released, I can push from the other side. This will create a gap on the attached side, which I can then easily insert a tool without causing damage. The last spot I'll need to release is at the bottom, and then our iPod housing is loose. I can spin it to the side so I don't have to disconnect that fragile cable. Removing the battery connector with a pair of tweezers you can see this iPod looks a little bit different on the inside as the hard drive itself is significantly larger as it has more platters than the other iPod models. This was the top of the line iPod in 2003 and 40 gigabytes worth of music is a lot of music today, let alone in 2003. With our old battery removed, you can see it was manufactured in 2004 and is the original battery to this iPod. I can install our new battery into place, routing the wire underneath the PCB. While I wasn't able to find the original price for one of these iPods, I'm guessing a 40 gig model would have run you around $1,000 in 2003. We will of course be reinstalling the 40 gigabyte hard drive. It's still functioning, it's part of this iPod's history, so unless it's broken, there's no need to replace it with an SD card. With it back into position, I can reinstall our new battery and flip around the back panel so we can test out the iPod. Powering it up, you can see it's running off of its own charge. However, 
There isn't much of that charge left, so I'll need to plug in the Firewire charger and let the device charge up. But I'm happy to say that our iPod is still functioning after the repairs. So I'll clip the back panel back into place and our iPod 40 gigabyte is ready to go. Of course, it wouldn't be a proper restoration if I didn't clean all the gunk from these devices. Using some alcohol and a cloth, I can wipe down the devices and use a toothbrush to clean the dirt from the recess buttons on the front. Moving over to the back, I use some citrus sticky spot remover to remove the gunk. This was also used to clean the cable from 17 years of dirt. Unlike newer Apple cables, this cable is made out of a plastic-like material and not the rubber style that we see today, and therefore this cable is a lot more durable. After cleaning, we're done. So this is it. We managed to get two out of the three devices working, with the broken one likely containing a working display and click wheel. I spent a total of $53.48 Australian on the devices, with the most costly part being the new battery. As for the charger, which I picked up for $10, its size is in between a MacBook and an iPhone charger but has a Firewire port on it. The charging output is 13 volts, which is significantly higher than the 5 volts that USB supplies. The largest 40GB iPod 3rd generation is very thick when compared to a 7th gen slim model. Even compared to my daily 5th generation, you can see the 3rd gen is still thicker. Of course, for 2003, this was a big achievement to fit such a capacity into such a tiny device. However, the lack of USB charging on this model causes some inconvenience compared to newer models. While this iPod works on my Apple Hi-Fi system, it will not work on my car unless I use an AUX cable. Hopefully these repairs can keep them going for another 17 years. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the electronics repair playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any tips or what tools I use to repair devices, be sure to check out my website, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video and I'll catch you guys next time.